Hello. This week we're going to attack our first problem, our first original question, and that's the question of excellence in the humanities, or rather the rhetoric thereof, because we're going to view the humanities as a cultural practice, and we're going to ask about the ways in which participants in that practice send signals and signs of what they believe to be excellence. Now, what do we mean by signals and signs? We're not going to go deep into the semiotics of the, the, the question, but roughly speaking, a signal might be the, the ways in which people intentionally do things to create meaning in another person's mind. And the signs, much more interesting perhaps, are the, the symptoms, the tracers uh, that people leave behind when they attempt to send signals, the implicit things that are going on when they wish to say, attend, let's say, to this. Uh, one reason I was led into this question, I mean, we're, we're using this in part as a demonstration, but it's also in and of itself a fascinating question. One reason I was led into this was um, in thinking about the ways in which scientists and people working in the humanities understood their task. Um, in the sciences, and I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that there's a certain amount of coherence among scientists about what counts as an excellent piece of science. And that's in part because we have folk tales that we share. So on the screen here, this is Benjamin Franklin. This is one of the classic folk tales that physicists will share. And in fact, you're gonna encounter, at least in an American high school, the story of how Ben Franklin, um, ridiculously enough, flew a kite into a Philadelphia rainstorm. Uh, this was not just an event uh, for Franklin. It wasn't just an event that we've, we've told stories about. Uh, but it's one that actually inaugurates an entire uh, era in the history of science itself. The, the account of this experiment was published in the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in the 1750s. Um, without going into the details of, of Franklin's context, um, the way it's seen um, as, again, as a sort of uh, mythology of how science ought to work is this is sort of this decisive experiment. And what Franklin is doing here is proving something, or at least establishing extraordinarily strong evidence for an account of the way in which electricity works. And in particular, by demonstrating the coherence of um, sort of uh, mundane sublunar uh, phenomena, sparks off, a, off, off cat's fur, um, and the meteorological phenomenon of lightning, uh, Franklin is making sense of a particular account of electricity, um, and in particular, the electrical fluid. Um, one of the other pieces that's going on here, in addition to Franklin uh, providing this kind of crucial evidence for a theory that people have to hand, or will very soon have to hand, the other thing that Franklin is doing is, is drawing phenomena together. So this is a second, uh, a, a second sort of value that, that sits around in the scientific mind or the scientific culture. Uh, in addition to experiments having this job of, you know, establishing or providing evidence for a theory or in the Popperian case, falsifying a theory. Um, one of the values we have as scientists is the idea that good theories, good experiments, good pieces of work establish universal principles for uh, uh, things that we see in the natural world. Uh, not necessarily universal in the sense of applying to every single phenomena, but perhaps better thought um, as the drawing together of distant phenomena. Uh, a term uh, William Hewell, one of the perhaps first philosophers of science, uh, master of Trinity College, polymath in many ways, um, that William Hewell called consilience, the leaping together of previously distinct things in the pursuit of, let's say, a simpler, more coherent, more reduced explanation. Um, these are things that sit around in the scientific mind, and then you say, okay, well, what, what accounts do people in the humanities have of what they're doing? Uh, when I started looking into this, one of the things that's quite fun, actually, is that there is not necessarily um, as coherent uh, a story about what makes for good work in the humanities. Uh, on the screen here, this is a book by one of our colleagues, Renz Bod, um, who's written one of the first histories of the humanities, and history in the sense means of history from the outside, providing an account of the development and origin of what uh, we might call the human sciences, the sciences of the human spirit. Um, Renz, um, in talking to Renz actually about the nature of the humanities, the value of the humanities, one of the things that he pointed out to me was the diversity of traditions 
And in particular, for example, the distinction between a continental tradition that sees um, the humanities in many ways as part of a continuum with the sciences, uh, something that maybe goes back to the origin of the German research university on the one hand, and on the other hand, a, a sort of Anglo-American, Anglosphere account of the humanities, it sees it more as this kind of habitus, this practice of reflection and interpretation. Um, we're not going to do the historiography of the humanities or the history of the historiography of the humanities. Um, most uh, books, let's say, in um, continental uh, or rather, sorry, comparative literature, uh, critical theory often contain these potted histories of uh, the humanities are often rather uh, polemical ones. But if we were to just sit in the 21st century and, and look at what actually happens, there's a couple things that come up. So uh, maybe and perhaps by contrast with the sciences. So where uh, a scientist might say, look, a valuable piece of science is one that establishes a theory in contraindication to another or that disproves a theory. Uh, the humanities as a discipline is much more comfortable with the idea of competing interpretations, right? So I write a great book on Hamlet and that book is in, in you know, inductive and deductive and abductive ways, completely incompatible with somebody else's account. And at the same time, I'm not going to say I've disproved this other person. I, I have a certain uh, tolerance, a certain willingness to understand that we have multiple views on the same object, views that may contradict each other. And in some sense, um, it's okay if there's no path, so no asymptotic path towards their reconciliation. Um, another perhaps distinction that we have is whereas in the sciences, uh, we have a sense of uh, this universality, the idea that, you know, basic things such as, let's say, the theory of evolution, um, the mathematical account of electromagnetism, uh, that we can sort of throw out the details, that we can toss away the, um, the idiosyncrasies. In many cases, um, accounts in the humanities are much more concerned with the exceptional. Um, what's unique about a particular text, a particular event, a particular process. Even, I would say, even when um, somebody in the humanities, let's say a historian, is intent upon finding universal, generalizable features of, let's say, um, you know, uh, uh, what is revolution. Um, at the same time, they'll be uh, concerned with paying attention to, attending to the differences between uh, the examples they use, the ways in which um, this revolution is or is not similar to that one, the ways in which the concept may have evolved over time, meaning each one, each of these iterations has some differences to it. Um, we can do this, we can oppose across the aisle, we can oppose across the cultures um, these distinctions, but rather than, you know, uh, kind of produce a philosophical account, let's, let's actually produce an empirical account. So this is uh, one way into the problem, which is, um, I would say, an empirical study. Um, when I started to ask why or how do we know when work in the humanities has gone right, and when I realized I certainly had no idea myself, um, one of the things I did was I said, well, let's just go look at great work in the humanities. So this is, um, this is a book by uh, one of our colleagues, Rebecca Spang, uh, Stuff and Money in the Time of the French Revolution. This is, I would say, buy this book. It's a great book. Uh, it's actually terrifically written. I, uh, when I started reading this, I, I sat in my armchair and I sort of, you know, sort of came to four chapters in and I had no idea how, how well I had been sucked in. Uh, I, asked, uh, I asked Rebecca, how, um, how do you write so well? And one of her pieces of advice was um, to read each sentence out, li uh, out loud, to read each sentence out loud and to, to edit it and refine it until it actually sounds good. So this is, if you, if you have the dedication, you can produce great, great, great prose. Um, but in addition to being a, a very addictive read, um, uh, Professor Spang's book is also, um, at least within the culture of the humanities, recognized as an excellent piece of work. So it's the winner of prizes. It's the winner of prizes from the highbrow popular press as well as from um, academic associations. Um, so there is something excellent about this. And then, okay, well, what's the natural thing to do, right? We'll just you know, turn the book over as we do. And let's, let's take a look 
at the blurbs that Rebecca's book received. Uh, we have three here. So, you know, if we just were to do a very surface level reading, um, here's Arthur Goldhammer in book forum. Uh, brilliant. What Spang proposes is nothing less than a new conceptualization of the revolution. She has provided historians and not just those of France or the French Revolution. Uh, with a new set of lenses with which to view the past. And so if we were just to sort of speculate a little bit here, we see, okay, look, there's this set of lenses, right? There's uh, new ways of perceiving, let's say, a familiar object. Um, Tony Barber in the Financial Times, Spang views the French Revolution from rewardingly new angles, right? Rewarding, is, what is this, you know, underlying this generative, empowering, um, Patrice uh, Higernet in the Times Literary Supplement and a brilliant, like a brilliant assertive book, right? Is is you, know, you might say, well, if if Franklin had the decisive experiment, does Rebecca have an assertive account of the French Revolution, or at least the role of of finance and and objects in the in the French Revolution? So you know, sitting in here is a an account. One thing, I mean, if you just you know sort of pay closer attention. Uh, this emphasis on newness, this emphasis on uh, the way in which this is something different from what's come before, um, the uh, this sort of rhetoric here, this 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 notion of brilliance, which is quite fun. The almost the idea that uh, uh, there's some sort of light coming off of of Rebecca's text, perhaps uh, you know, being refracted through the lenses. So there's 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 metaphors and tropes sitting in here, as well as sort of basic assertions like. You know, uh, Tony Barber says you're going to get rewarded by reading this. So there's there's a great complexity in the ways in which participants in the practice of the humanities are communicating to uh, value to each other. Uh, you might think of this as a as a as a problem in the, the rhetoric of encomium, right? Uh, we have what do we have? Just as as a, at a surface glance, right? Novelty, right? The notion that Rebecca has done something new, uh, the notion of enlightenment, sort of a literal metaphor. Literal enlightenment meaning light coming off an object used as a metaphor. Um, it's hard not to notice, of course, as well, that people love these uh, kind of euphonic things, the use of assonance and consonants, the, the sort of the, the 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 sound of these blurbs. Um, if you've ever written, I was if you ever written a blurb, I remember I was very proud when I was first asked to write a blurb. And I spent sort of you know, hours working on this blurb and I sent it in. And I felt my blurb should have a blurb. It was so good. Um, we spend time uh, as, as scholars figuring out the ways in which to praise each other in, in these short places. Um, I dug sort of deeper into this. Um, I, I texted one of my colleagues who I will, I will leave nameless um, and say, well, look, if you were to praise uh, a work in, uh, in your field, in, your, in, in this case, literature, you know, what would you say? Well, um, you know, my, my, my colleague writes and she says, well, you know, maybe seminal, right? Paradigm shifting, um, a notion of generativity again, perhaps, um, a notion of you know, perhaps in this case, uh, a more sci science-like notion of replacement. We've taken one paradigm, replaced it by another. Um, we have, again, interestingly enough, we have this notion of illumination, uh, the idea that something good in the humanities, something valuable, is something that in some case sheds light on, on the object. Now, maybe that's simply a trope. Maybe there's something more semantic in there. And again, um, just as with Patrice uh, Higernet and Tony Barber, uh, this idea that there's something new and there's something novel. Uh, so um, just for purely for fun, actually, I emailed Rebecca and I said, you know, look, let's um, uh, let's 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 talk a little bit about uh, what these blurbs are doing. You know, tell me about the blurbs you've gotten. And one of the first things Rebecca said is, ah, like my my naive colleague, uh, these blurbs are not records of of judgments of value. They are records of judgments of value filtered in, in her case through the marketing department of Harvard University Press. Um, the other thing uh, Rebecca drew, drew my attention to, she said, well, look, we look at what, um, how the blurbs worked on my first book. Uh, her first book was on restaurants. Uh, they, I hate to say this, they, they uh, uh, well, one thing she pointed out was that the book, in part because it was seen to have um, sort of large scale public interest, the history of the restaurant, a place it turns out where you go not to eat. Um, the the the, uh, the sources of authority in this case are much more from the popular press, the the, the L.A. Times, the New Yorker, um, and just sort of, you know, sort of devastatingly, the, the 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 puns are are sort of coming thick and fast. 
Um, blurbs are doing a lot of things. They're 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 playing roles in uh, the academic world. Um, a, an old old friend of mine, Joan Houlihan, a poet um, involved in the the early twenty first century poetry wars, um, uh, and a very polemical, very opinionated uh, poet and critic. Uh, yeah, Joan pointed out years ago um, the that the the blurbs on the back of of contemporary poetry, particularly contemporary poetry published out of MFA programs and through university presses, had reached this kind of pitch of of you know blurb apophenia, where um, you know every book, you know the back of every book of poetry was this sort of a necessary book, um, and it was unclear right necessary. What does it mean for a book of poetry to be necessary? Like is it you know modally necessary in every every possible world the book has been written. Um, uh, Joan in, in her, in this essay, it's a lovely essay, it's a long time ago now, but uh, Joan in her essay um, draws a lot of attention to the extent to which, you know, a blurb, particularly for something intense, intellectual, difficult, rebarbative, um, a blurb is in the business of selling something um, whose value really can't be immediately immediately verified. Um, I, I will read Rebecca's book. It won't make me necessarily instantaneously rich. It won't necessarily make me happy. And so um, blurbs, their value in, in these worlds, it's related to the problem of advertising, but and also in many ways is sort of quite different. So um, Joan's, Joan's essay, we'll put it in the recommended reading, is, is lovely. In part, um, I wouldn't necessarily say as a, as a normative claim or even an interpretive claim, but just to see the ways in which we debate value in the presentation of value. Um, so, so where are we here? The, the, the question I've come around to pose for us is uh, regards the, the question of rhetoric of excellence in the humanities. And you know, what's sitting around here? Well, there are sort of sociological questions, right? Um, how, how do institutions construct themselves and in particular, you know, every academic has to go through peer review, has to go through, uh, you know, uh, tenure letters. Um, how do institutions construct themselves around praise? Uh, there are uh, questions as well about the particular historical process of, of this normative valuing task, right? So where, where did blurbs come from, right? What's, what's the role that blurbs are playing in the larger academic context? Um, this is what we might think of as this genre, this paratextual genre. A blurb is not itself a text. It's about it's sitting outside or around another text. It's like the cover of the book. It's like the dedication of the book. Um, it's playing some sort of critical uh, uh, role in the ways in which we sell monographs and the ways in which we understand even the very purpose of a university. Um, if we were to sort of, you know, riff on this as a uh, humanities analytics problem, um, what are we going to do? Well, maybe what we might do, and we'll talk about this as a, as a possibility, let's, let's get a big data set of blurbs. I mean, screw it, right? Get, get a big archive and let's look at the patterns. Let's look at the signals that are flowing back and forth within a blurb, between blurbs, as blurbs evolve over time, uh, as blurbs signal things about the book, signal things about the blurber, th signal things about the, the, the field, the, the author. Um, we'll get the metadata, the, the names, the journals, and the presses. And let's try to make sense of this critical question, um, not, let's say, from the point of view of blurbs as narrative, uh, not even necessarily blurbs in a particular historical context, but now blurbs as a system of patterns and signals. In the previous lecture, in our introductory lecture, we uh, we talked. To, we gave three examples where we talked about, uh, roughly speaking, two styles of of cultural analytics, of humanities analytics. One is um, through the use of categories, categorization, pattern matching, and the other is through understanding a system as a uh, collection of signals, of correlations, of signs, of uh, interactions between different features of the process. So let's let's begin with the case of categories, and we might imagine um, asking, let's say, a diachronic question, having identified particular patterns of praise within blurbs. We can ask questions like, well, how do these blurbs evolve over time? Like, what's the history of the blurb? We find um, a data set of blurbs. We, maybe we ring up our favorite university press. We um, uh, find an undergraduate to help code them, or at least literally type them in. Um, 
And, you know, if we are able to, and this would be a sort of parallel to the work that um, Tatiana, Madeline, and and I worked on in the case of the Russian diaries, we might be able to um, to find patterns and to group them into sort of coherent uh, 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 pattern groups and then just ask, well, you know, look, uh, how do they evolve over time? In the case of the Russian diaries, we found this remarkable level of stability. Um, this may or may not um, hold in the case of blurbs. If, let's say, we ran this through an analysis pipeline where, um, in the Russian diaries, we found spirit versus routine. Maybe in the case of the blurbs, we find metaphors of enlightenment, literally light flowing off of objects, scattering off of books, um, and then rhetorics of novelty or rhetorics of reward. Uh, we can also think in terms of signals. So if we identify patterns, we identify features of the blurbs, we can also ask questions like, well, to what extent does a blurb predict the field that the book occurs in. And so having asked that question, we can learn a great deal. We might ask, for example, what are the characteristic patterns of different fields? What are the, what are the tropes we find in the praise of a work of history versus the praise of a work of analytic philosophy, the praise of a piece of work in comparative literature? Um, we can do similar things. Um, you know, an obvious question to ask, it's uh, something certainly in the psychological uh, 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 world, or at least in the world of psychological research, is one of the strongest effects one almost always sees, which is gender effects. Uh, we can ask, well, you know, look, how does the nature of the blur project, uh, predict or correlate with the gender of the author, or perhaps the gender of the blurber? Uh, this can go both ways. What's, how does the blur predict the gender? Or conversely, if we know the gender, what, what do we know about with how that blurb is going to look? Um, we can ask similar questions as we did in the, you know, maybe perhaps we would ask in the case of field, what are the characteristic ways in which uh, uh, authors of different gender are praised? Um, but we can also, in fact, and this is, uh, ties into the first example you saw last week, um, even just look for the emergence of signals or perhaps, conversely, the disappearance in this case. Uh, do blurbs increasingly predict gender over time? Or um, you know, did, did blurbs begin as gendered and, and enter a non-gendered phase? One can imagine this going both ways. It's a substantive question, one that could be uh, one whose answer in either direction is potentially particularly interesting. Uh, in all of these cases, you know, in the first and the categorization and the looking uh, in you know, trying to sort uh, blurbs into particular styles, um, and in the case of using those styles or those, those patterns to, to, to predict the metadata, things like field or, or gender or, or uh, institution, um, in both of these cases, we have this underlying question that, that repeatedly returns for us, which is the question of, is this a signal uh, meaning, is this something that the the blurb -er in, or the marketing department is consciously or sort of with awareness or some kind of uh, uh, some kind of intentionality attempting to produce for the reader, or the potential purchaser, the the person who um, is evaluating that the 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 author's uh, uh, excellence, or is it more like a sign, uh, something that is is driven by processes that may or may not be transparent? To the person writing. So in both of these cases, the case of the category, uh, the case of the, um, uh, the study of blurbs as a system of patterns that evolve over time, or the case of signals um, where you know, a blurb is predicting a field or predicting a gender, or predicting some kind of quantity or feature, some sociological, demographic, or conceptual, even philosophical feature. Um, in both of these cases, the question of signal versus sign is at play. Um, we can dig deeper into this, and um, here's just an example. This is um, a, a recent book of philosophy by er, uh, Irad Kimi. Uh, became quite uh, uh, quite sort of uh, discussed among the in the philosophical community. Um, this is his book, Thinking and Being. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, the, the the blurbs in play here. Um, these are quite different from um, uh, Rebecca Spang's blurbs. Um, so uh, one thing you'll notice here is, um, and I'll read some of these critical points. This is uh, um, a gentleman writing the point. It would, be, it would be remiss to downplay the enormous effort required to understand this book. Uh, Jonathan Lear of the University of Chicago. Uh, Irai Kimi's thinking and being is a profound philosophical inquiry into mind and world. The text is difficult. 
I had to work very hard at every sentence uh, in order to make sure I was following the argument. Uh, the New York Times book review to his admirers, Kimi is a hidden giant, a profound thinker. Uh, the Times perhaps is less willing than Jonathan Lear to, to say that this book is very, very hard to read. Uh, in all these cases, this is something interesting. We, we we're seeing this perhaps unusual pattern here of the difficulty of the text being highlighted. Um, we look at other places in these blurbs. We look at the words we might track in some kind of quantitative analysis. Um, we see, just as we did now, and that we see some similarities with Rebecca's case. Um, uh, the point says don't, there are rewards. This book is rewarding. Um, uh, Sebastian Rodel at the University of Leipzig. Uh, this book is the most rewarding. So this, uh, this odd sort of reiteration of a particular... <coughs> not just even trope, excuse me, not just even trope, but just literally um, uh, word, uh, choice of word, lexical, lexical object repeated over and over again. Um, this brings to mind not just the question of, um, you know, what are these people doing? How is one piece of data predicting another? Um, you know, one question I might have is this, is this what analytic philosophers do, sort of talk about how difficult um, all their books are? Uh, but another thing that comes up here is a, is a feature of our third example from last week, which is the extent to which people are copying each other, imitating each other's styles, um, imitating even each other's word choices. You want to write a blurb, well, how do you know how to write a blurb except by looking at the blurbs that have come before? Um, there's no blurb on the back of Phenomenology of Spirit, though. Um, uh, Another uh, chunk here, this is, we'll put this in green, this is um, uh, uh, other features that you can see sitting inside uh, these blurbs. Uh, this is uh, the point, Jonathan Lear and Sebastian Rodel, uh, all of them also just as uh, in the case of Rebecca's book, just as in the case of my uh, uh, correspondent over text message, um, this emphasis on novelty as well, the idea that there's this, you know, uh, that Irad's book is radical new. It's a turning point. It's it's something that has revised what's come before. It's uh, not just a turning, but a revolution, uh, revolutionary book in uh, Sebastian's uh, account of it. So what's going on here? Well, there's a couple pieces. Um, one is the technical uh, possibility that we might not just uh, look for individual words. We might not sort of get our collection of words uh, but we might use automated methods to find words that tend to go together. So perhaps uh, we might find, just as we did in the case of the French Revolution, uh, the, the, we might use uh, uh, methods to find co-occurring patterns of words, and not gen just co-occurring patterns of words, but uh, the ways in which those patterns might assemble or reassemble together, sort of like Lego bricks, right? So the, the, the claim here potentially is with, you know, a little bit of typing um, and, uh, you know, a friend uh, with some Python. Uh, one might say not only can we identify patterns of blurbs, not only can we identify systematic uses of related words, but we may also be able to resolve a blurb or the collection of, blur of blurbs on the back of a single book into particular weighted combinations of patterns. And so now we can ask not only how does the strength of a pattern change over time, you know, in the 1960s, do we suddenly talk about turns and revolutions and novelty, uh, but also the ways in which, let's say, talk about novelty may or may not be combined with talk about, let's say, difficulty. So these are all the pieces that are sitting in here, potential sources of investigation. Uh, let's see where we've gotten in uh, our second week. Uh, what we've done, I've begun at least, with the suggestion or the idea that the question, the examination of excellence in the humanities, uh, not again as a normative case, we're not going to tell, you know, the goal here is not to figure out what the best book is. The goal is not to figure out, um, you know, can the blurb uh, predict the value of the book in some, in some uh, sort of uh, ought as opposed to is fashion. Uh, but just what is the practice of praise? How does praise work? Um, we then moved on to the, the different ways that question could be asked. So we suggested, for example, that there was a sociological angle to the problem, uh, the formation of institutions around norms, the formation, you know, the use of evaluative judgments in the constitution of a field, the constitution of an identity, uh, and maybe in a sort of uh, 
uh, Pierre Baudreau sense. Uh, we also have, let's say, a historical question or maybe a, a, a question about the, the, the story of how these things emerge over time within a particular context. What are blurbs doing in uh, the course of a uh, series of events in the course of the establishment of, let's say, the modern research university? Um, and then finally, we, we presented this, the, the idea that one could do a, a cultural analytics study. This is a, one that might contribute to a sociological or historical account, but on the other hand, has a very distinct approach. Uh, one that begins not only with a, you know, a big data set, a database, um, a, a large collection, a sufficiently large collection of documents such that uh, an automated system can find or create patterns from the, the text, but also a style of analysis that focuses less on the particular content, or at least the content, the nature, the semantics, the meaning of these of the patterns is deferred for later analysis, as it was in the case of the uh, the Russian diaries, um, to to resolve the uh, these things in a different way, to look at the uh, look at them as a system of patterns, ask uh, you know in the first analysis how these patterns evolve over time. And then also to see uh, uh, blurbing, uh, praise, this sort of ritual notion of praise, uh, in terms of signals, the way we did uh, with the Old Bailey in the first uh, lecture, the first example. Uh, asking questions, for example, about how the blur predicts a field, uh, asking about what different fields, different, uh, different parts of the academy, how they choose to praise each other, or rather praise themselves and their colleagues. Uh, we can ask questions about the demographics and the sociology of that value formation. But again, in uh, the with the idea that these things are signaling one signaling another. So the question of, for example, did blurbs at some point become gendered uh, when there were very few uh, female authors in a particular discipline, let's say, uh, did blurbs, uh, were, there, were there differences accentuated or were there differences uh, minimized? Uh, what happens as, as the number of authors of a particular demographic increase or decrease over time. Uh, finally, we gestured at, and this is something that will develop over the course of this, uh, this week, or sorry, this, this uh, series of lectures, uh, the ways in which we might dig deeper into these patterns, the reason we might want to go beyond, for example, just spotting words and by hand writing down categories of, um, you know, blurbs of the metaphor of light, blurbs as the metaphor of reward or the, the promise of reward uh, into more sophisticated machine learning methods that might, uh, as in the case of our French Revolution analysis, uh, find correlations between words to produce patterns and then find within any particular document a combination of patterns that might tell us not just about the increase or decrease of a metaphor, but the ways in which uh, things get linked together. Uh, we'll see in upcoming lectures uh, where we use the example of the linkage of concepts of capitalism and concepts of democracy in journalism. Uh, we'll see these kinds of analyses uh, in a, uh, a reasonably simple form uh, coming very soon. Thank you.